thing apart from introducing you to Jesus Christ as your Savior, which is most important and foremost. If I could do anything, I, I, would, I would beg you to fall in love with this book right here and realize how rich and wonderful it is. And the truth of the matter is, I'm absolutely overwhelmed this morning with a thought from this book that I want to share with you. And I want you to go with me this morning. Uh, I was amazed in Sunday school where Melvin covered, it was like, an, it was like I, had, I really did not know where he was teaching in Sunday school. I didn't hear last week, or this lesson began, I did not know that you were teaching on Jesus as, as you have been. But the lesson this morning pre prepared the, the way, not for the preaching, but for this truth, that they go hand in hand. And there's no greater subject, there's no greater topic that we can discuss than Jesus. Nothing. There's no other name like the name of Jesus. And the Bible says, we're going to read in Matthew chapter 27, is where I ask you to turn to, is that correct? Matthew 27, and then we'll turn to Psalm 3 also in just a minute, but Matthew 27, verse number 21, the governor answered and said to them, whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas, the, the, the crowd, the, the multitude of the people cried, Release Barabbas. And Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. This mob of people cry out unanimously, Let Jesus be crucified. He had done no wrong to them. He had never hurt one of them. He had never lied to them. Listen, he had never lied to them. He had, ne he had never done anything wrong to any of them. He had not sinned against any of them. But here at this point in time, they all demand his crucifixion. They demand that he be hung on a cross, with his hands nailed to the cross and his feet nailed to the cross, and they demand that he suffer cruel death on Calvary, unanimously, without hesitation, instantly demand that he be crucified. And the governor said, why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, let him be crucified. Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing but rather a tumult was made. He took water and washed his hands before the multitude saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. Pilate had said that he had found no fault in him. He was guilty of nothing. He was without blemish. He was perfect. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus... When he had scourged him, meaning to, to afflict pain to him, to use the, what they would use, the whipping post, the cat of nine tails, a whip with glass attached to it, nine ends, which they would strip a person's body of their clothing and they would whip them with that cat of nine tail, whipped his body. Then the soldiers... Paul, this band of soldiers, if just so you understand, equaled about 500 men, this band of soldiers. And Jesus is released to this, these soldiers to, for them to do to him whatever they determined to do. 500 soldiers, not 500 weak men, but 500 Roman trained soldiers now have full reign over the body of Jesus. They begin to beat him. The Bible says they came by, they, 
plaited a crown of thorns and they put it upon his head and crushed it in his head. They put upon him a mock robe. They took a, a reed, the Bible said, a stick, and, and beat him in the head. Think about that. You ever been hit in the head? Once? Not once, but they began to beat him in the head with that reed to smote him in the head. Then they came by with their fists and began to hit him and begin to mock him. And, and they said, tell us who's hit you. You're God. Who's smiting you in the head? 500 soldiers have full reign over the body of Jesus to torture and to humiliate him. Not a bone of his body was broken. The Bible says they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. When they played at the crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. They bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and they spit upon him. And they took the reed from him and they smote him on the head, the Bible says. And after that, they had mocked him. They took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. Now follow this. Jesus is all alone. There's no one standing with him. There's no one with him to help him at this point in time. He's alone and he's forsaken. He's abandoned. He's, there's no one there. So the, the Bible says they compelled this man. They found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. In a humiliating way, they find this man here that says, hey, uh, this guy has no friends. He has nobody that cares about him. This is what is the, the picture. There's no one willing to help him. This, this man ha, who is only ever loved and given of himself, there's no one to help him bear his cross. They found this man, Simon, and they said, you help him bear his cross. You help him. And when they were coming to a, a place called Golgotha, that is to say a place of the skull, they gave him vinegar, vinegar to drink and mingled with gall. And when he had tasted there, he would not drink. And they crucified and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture they did cast lots. And setting down, they watched him there. This audience of people sat down like they were at a, at, a, at a sporting event or at some kind of an entertainment show. And they just sat down and they began to watch to see what Jesus would do while he's after he's been beaten and stripped of his clothing and hung on a cross. They sat down to watch what would happen. And, and they set up over his head an accusation written, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Then were two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And they, they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads. And, and they said, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, also the chief priests mocking him and, and with the scribes and elders said, he saved others. Himself, he cannot save. They said mockingly, if he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. Then they said, he trusted in God. Let him deliver him if he will have him. He trusted in God. Let God deliver him if he'll have him. For he said, I'm the son of God. Surely, if this is God's son and God is all powerful and God's watching what's going on, God will do, God will intervene. God will help him. But he didn't. He left him there. 
The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. So these thieves follow me. They begin to mock Jesus and they begin to ridicule him in the very same way. And these people are walking by mocking him and saying, if he is the son of God, God will help him. The Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that you would help us. Dear Lord God, I pray for the folks that are here, Lord, who maybe, maybe have never heard, maybe only have seen a picture, but maybe have never comprehended Calvary. Dear Lord God, please, Lord, give us a view of Calvary. God, that we'll never forget. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You see, salvation had to come, it can only come through the cross. Jesus had to bear the cross. He had to go to Calvary. He had to die. He had to be crucified. He had to shed his blood on that cross so that you and I don't have to go to hell. Amen. We, get, we can go to heaven because we put our faith and trust in Jesus. Now we know the rest of the story. We know that he died on that cross. We know that they took him off that cross. And we know that they buried him in a borrowed tomb. And we know that after three days he arose. And we know, according to the Bible, that he, right now he sits at the right hand of the throne of the Father where he intercedes on our behalf. And what he did on the cross is, listen, is my hope of salvation and your hope of salvation. We know that. There's no other way around this thing. You can't get to heaven except through the cross of Jesus Christ. But even those of us here that know that the best need to make sure we picture and remember the cross. Amen. Psalm chapter number three in your Bible, if you'll turn there with me. Psalm chapter number three. Psalm chapter three, verse number three. The Bible says here, follow me. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? It's not a question. Look at the exclamation point. How are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. This psalm, forget that it's a psalm of David. This is not, here this morning, this is not a psalm of David. Uh, David prophesied of the cross. He knew about, God gave him knowledge of the cross. And this psalm, David may have been the author, but this psalm is telling us of Jesus this morning, of what we just read. On the cross, Jesus looked and he's seen the masses. Before he ever went to the cross, he's seen, he was witness to the multitude of people. He was not surprised, he was not in question, he was not surprised, but he, he was exclaiming, many are they that are here to crucify me. Not a few, but a multitude. Nearly the whole nation had come out uh, to demand his crucifixion. Many are they, he said, that, are, that many are they that rise up against me. And then notice in verse number two, many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. Remember what we just read? Yeah. Remember what they said? They said, if, if he be the son of God, surely God will help him. Hey, God will come and take him off the cross. Hey, God will, won't leave him up there. What father would leave their son to be crucified like this? What father would stand by idly having the all power? What dad would stand by and let his own son be tortured like this? Something's going to happen where either he's the son of God or he's not. If he is the son of God, then surely God will help him. But as hour after hour pass and moment after after a moment passed, the people became more and more convinced that Jesus was a fake, that he was an imposter, that he was a fraud, because surely God would help him. But God didn't come to take him off the cross. And I'm going to tell you why. Because God couldn't take him off the cross. He had to go to the cross. He had to endure Calvary for us so that we could be saved. But this psalm tells us prophetically what was happening. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. The religious leader said, there's no hope. There's no help. Hey, if he be the son of God, let God come and take him off the cross. 
And he saved others himself he cannot save. The thieves on one side or the other. We know the story. Listen, one of the thieves eventually got saved and put his faith and trust in Jesus. But at one point in time, both of them mocked him and ridiculed him and said, hey, get us off of here if you are who you say you are. And together the people came to the unanimous decision. There's no hope. God's not going to help you. He's not coming. He's not getting you off here. He ain't coming. They mocked him. Huh? He saved others himself. He cannot save. If you be the son of God, surely God will get you off the cross. But he didn't. The Bible says, but thou, o Lord, listen, thou, o Lord, art a shield for me. My glory and the lifter up of mine head. I love that song, the lifter up of mine head. You don't know how many times I've taken that and used that for myself. And because he is the one. You ever, have you ever been so burdened that you couldn't lift your head? Have you ever been so down and out that you just couldn't even look up? And, you, and, and you're overwhelmed and you're thinking, what am I going to do? You'll be there someday. I promise you there'll be a season of life in your life where you'll be so overcome by the circumstances of life that you you won't even be able to lift your head. But there's a one, there is a God in heaven who is able, who, you'll get to know him someday as the lifter up of your head. Amen. He's the one that can lift your head whenever there is no other hope. You'll get to know that someday. He says, thou art the lifter up of mine head. He said, I cried unto the Lord with my voice and he heard me out of his holy hill, Selah. He said, I laid me down and slept. How many of you know that every time Jesus ever talked about death, he talked about sleep? How many of you know that Jesus said, I lay down my life, no man taketh it from me? How many of you knew that he said that? Listen, hey, Jesus laid down his life. He said, I give it freely. He laid down his life. How many of you know that on the cross, Jesus cried, it is finished and he cried lama sabachthani into thy hands he said i commit my spirit father and he laid down his life they how many of you know that they came by to break his legs but the bible had prophesied that not a bone of his body would be broken and they did that to to hasten death so that the person hanging on the cross would no longer be able to keep themselves alive they they would usually die of suffocation because when they would break their legs they would fall beneath the weight of their body and they would not be able uh, to breathe anymore and they would die they came to break the legs of jesus and he was already dead he didn't fight death because he knew he didn't come to fight death he came to conquer death every other person that ever hung on that cross sometimes people would hang on that cross for days because they didn't want to die. They were afraid of death. But Jesus wasn't afraid of death. Amen. He was conqueror over death. He knew what was going to happen. But yet he suffered. And the father. He cried it's finished. And he gave up the ghost. He said to God in that hands I commit my spirit. And he breathed his last breath. God answered his prayer. And it was finished. In the garden of Gethsemane, he had prayed, God, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But if not, but now it's over. Amen. The suffering is over. The trial of mocking is over. The scourging is over. The, all, all that Jesus had to endure, it's all over now. Amen. He's safe in the presence of the Father. Yes, he had to uh, suffer. Uh, he, he, th there were some events that took place after his death, but the suffering is over. Amen? Amen. It's over. You ever face something you didn't want to do and you were so glad when it's over? Amen. The greatest words in the Bible, someone once says, were it came to pass. Amen? It didn't come to stay. It came to pass. When you're in a valley, yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I don't fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. We know that God's with us in the valley. We know that he's with us in the suffering. We know that he said he'll never leave us or forsake us. We know that we'll not have to walk one mile of the way in this earth without God with us. He said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. 
The Bible says, I cried in the Lord my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. He said, I laid me down and slept. I wait for the Lord to sustain me. Listen, I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people that have set themselves against me round about. That's Jesus right there. He said, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Hey, hey, when Jesus died on the cross, the devil lost all power that he ever had had. All power was gone from the cross. Amen. Death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? Hey, the sting of death is gone, or the victory of the grave is gone, and Jesus Christ is the victor over the dark domain. He's taken away the teeth of death. Now all death can do is chew on you and jaw on you, but it can't swallow you. It can't devour you. Jesus detoothed the lion. Amen. Amen. Thank God for that this morning. Look what the next verse says. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Hey, what's Jesus saying there? He's saying that he's purchased salvation. You can't lose your salvation because it's not yours. It belongs to God. Amen. Hey, he purchased it with his blood on Calvary. And so he said salvation belongs to the Lord. It doesn't belong to the church. It doesn't belong to the preacher. It doesn't belong to the domination. It belongs to God. And Jesus won the battle on the cross. He purchased salvation for the Father. Your salvation. The next part says, thy blessing is upon thy people, Selah. That's what Jesus did. He, he is the blessing, amen? He is the promised seed. And when Jesus finished what he did come to do on Calvary, he said, it is finished. Now follow me. In the 1600s, there was a, a man named James, uh, James Thomas Shepherd. Thomas Shepard was the son of a preacher, and he himself became a preacher. And his first church he started was in a barn. My kind of preacher, amen. And this man, Thomas Shepard, uh, wrote a few songs, and he wrote a few poems. The first poem that he wrote was actually about this man, Simon of Cyrene. And, but, but the title of the song is, Must Jesus Bear the Cross Alone? I need, uh, let me get two of you fellas here. Uh, Caleb, come on up here. Cam, you come on up here. The rest of you try to stay awake for a few minutes. I'm awake, so ask God to help you. This is not the cross. I, I was going to use Isaiah, but he's tied up right there. He's, he's got, so, but this is not the cross, and I'm not going to undo the wedding. But uh, can one of you fellas, can you pick, Caleb, get up in that thing and straddle that thing and pick it up there just for a minute if you can. And turn around here. What would you? About what would you weigh that thing, Caleb? Uh, forty pounds. Forty? You think forty? Yeah. Okay. I was thinking a little bit heavier, but uh, we're going to go with forty pounds. The cross of Jesus weighed, they say, about sixty to seventy pounds. Right. Hold it up there. Hold, did you already set it down? No. Okay, you got to hold it. <laughs> Come up here, man. You're going to hold it here because, listen to me, because he's going to carry it. He's going to carry it the length of six and a half football fields. But first, he's going to be beaten. First, someone's going to take a reed and smote him in the head. He's going to be scourged. He didn't sleep at all last night. Probably hadn't eaten. Jesus was no mere, he was a mortal man, but he was a man. That's why when they said, behold the man, you're going to go six football fields and a half, 650 yards. He's going to carry that cross and uh, uh, you're, you're going to, Simon, you're going to help him here just in case. But the truth of the matter is, Simon didn't have to really help him. It's a misnomer that Jesus fell beneath the weight of the cross. He carried his cross. But he was going to carry it alone. And the people looked and said, there's no way he can do it. 
and Jesus had to bear his cross alone. No one was willing to help him. That's how forsaken he was. That's how alone he was. This man that had all these people following him and all these multitudes. You still got it? Getting heavy? How much is it weigh now? I think your guess was a little bit Okay. <laughs> he thinks my guess was a little bit better. All right. So, but listen, but remember you, but, but you've not been beaten, have you? You not been? Have you been hit in the head with a reed? Have you been smote? Have you been smitten by two hundred to five hundred Roman soldiers in the head? No. No. Have you been deprived of food or water or sleep? No. No. He's going to carry that cross the length of six and a half football fields. Hey, hey take your NFL uh, heroes and and put a cross on their back and let them run the field. Can't walk the field six and a half times carrying that cross. But he's going to do it alone. And so the people compel this man, Simon. They said, you help him. Somebody has to help him. Nobody wants to help him. Nobody wants to aid him. He's all alone. He's forsaken. And by the way, that's still today. We still have to compel people to help Jesus. All of my life, I've heard preachers beg and plead. The Apostle Paul said, Wherefore, brother, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be it transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He said that word beseech means I beg you. All of my life, I've heard preachers come to church and plead with people and beg people to surrender their life to him and just to, just to, just to give uh, to the Lord's work and, and be faithful to the Lord's work. Even that is a difficult for thing for most, most people. We spend most of our lives compelling people to stand with Jesus. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. For some reason, nobody wants to stand with Jesus. For some reason, we would just as soon leave him to bear his cross alone. But he said, there's a cross for you too. And you must bear it. But we have him as an example. And thank God we have him as an example. A man who was compelled, but even though he was compelled, he was willing to do it. I believe Simon was a follower of Christ. He was a well-known man. He had two sons. The people that came to bury him came at nighttime because they were afraid to identify with him. Only three people stood with him by the cross. Peter had denied him, cursed and swore and said, I know not the man. It's a big deal. It's a big deal to stand with Jesus. Because most people run away from him. Most people uh, don't want to identify with him. And they get made fun of. Oh, you're one of them Jesus people, huh? What are you, Billy Bible School? What are you, look at you, ha, ha, ha. There's nobody more derided, more mocked, more made fun of. If you want to stand alone, you stand up for Jesus because the world's going to mock you. They're going to laugh at you. But I'm going to tell you what. My Savior Jesus carried a cross six and a half football fields for me after he'd been beaten and bruised and then he laid himself down and at any point in time he could have said father it's over but he didn't do that he did all of that for me because he wanted to go to the cross and die for me Amen. because he loved me you can put that back I want to show you something here the song says must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free thank you guys I love you you too love you okay. I love you guys too but I want you to know something Whatever love I would have for you pales in comparison to how much God loves you. I'm going to tell you something. God loved His Son when He hung on that cross. I want to show you something this morning. The song says, Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone. And there's a cross for me. But is there one for you? The consecrated cross I'll bear. You say, it's hot in here. I can hardly stand it. Oh. It's going to be hot this week at camp. I can hardly stand it. 
And some of you have no idea how hot it's going to be. I went, we went home last night, and we weren't bragging about how much we stunk. We walked in Walmart, and people ran out the other door. They, I mean, we had the whole, I mean, they were running from us. I mean, you sweat until you think you can't sweat anymore. But that's nothing in comparison to what Jesus suffered. So I went soul winning once and someone slammed a door in my face. I'm not going by. Nothing. Somebody laughed at me for being a Christian and they will. You know why? Because they don't know how great a savior our Jesus is. Trust me. It's sad that sometimes we portray Christianity in a weird sissy type of way, but I promise you there was nothing soft or effeminate or weak about Jesus Christ. Amen. Take that guy on TV that portrays him, put that cross on his back after he's been beaten. And I watched the show after he walked, walks the length of six and a half football fields with that cross on his back. I might watch an episode. But until then, I don't need to watch that because I've got it right here. I can see the real Savior, Jesus. The song said, the consecrated cross I'll bear till death shall set me free and then go home, my crown to wear, for there's a crown for me upon the crystal pavement down at Jesus' pierced feet. Joyful I'll cast my golden crown at his, and his dear name repeat. Oh, precious cross, oh, glorious crown, oh, resurrection day, ye angels from the stars come down and bear my soul. Away. Follow me, I'm on, we're near the end here. Many there be which say of my soul, there's no help for him in God. God's not going to help him. Can somebody tell me what happened at about the sixth hour while Jesus was on the cross? What was there? Darkness. Don't, don't tell me you know why unless you know why. But there was darkness for the space of three hours. The people were gathered around watching Jesus. They were mocking him. But there was a three-hour intermission. Listen. The Bible says, in the book of Exodus, and the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near into the thick darkness. Where God was. God came down on the mountain, and he appeared to Moses, and the people drew away from God because God appeared. When God appeared, there was a thick darkness around him. The Bible said in Deuteronomy 4.11, And you came near and stood under the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire under the midst of heaven, and darkness, clouds, and thick darkness. You see, because if someone would look upon God, they would die. Jesus is on the cross at the sixth hour. Do you see where we're going? They're mocking him. Where's your father at now? Where's your God at now? Jesus said, I go to the cross. He said, but I'm not alone. Father's with me. You see, Jesus was 100% God. He's 100% man. In Gethsemane, he prayed. And he prayed, as it were, the Bible says, his sweat as great drops of blood. And God sent an angel and strengthened him because he feared. He was in agony. Now he's bearing a reproach and a shame that no man has ever borne. Beside the physical suffering, the bearing of our sins. He's a, all, all of our sins are about to be placed on him before he dies. The Bible says this. In Deuteronomy 5.22, these, these, words, these words the Lord spoke unto all the assembly in the mount out of the midst of the fire, of the cloud, of the thick darkness, with a great voice. 1 Kings 8, 12 says, Then spake Solomon, the Lord said, that he would dwell in the thick darkness. 
Jesus is on the cross. The people are mocking him. If, if he be God, let God, if he's the son of God, let God come and save him. What happened at the ninth hour when the veil was, when the darkness went away? Jesus cried something. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then he prayed and he gave up the ghost. Listen. Thou, Lord, art a shield. Who was watching Jesus while he was there? Well, now, what was that multitude? They were laughing at him. They were jeering him. What's a shield do? It separates you from everybody else. You can call me whatever you want to call me. And I ask the Lord to tell me if I'm wrong. But during that three hours of darkness... I'm going to go out and testify the Father was with him. Amen. Amen. And at the end of the three hours, Jesus cried, My God, my God, why hast thou? When did he forsake it? When he went away. Three hours transpired. Three hours of darkness. Hey, God dwells in the thick darkness. Nobody could see anything. There was nobody mocking him. There was nobody reproaching him. The crowd that sat down to watch, all of a sudden the lights went out. And he was a, he, they couldn't see him anymore. And I'll tell you why. Because the Father was with him. The same God, listen, that same God says to us, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And so here Jesus says, thou art a shield for me, my glory, and the what? The lifter up of mine head. That's how Jesus endured the cross. That's how he despised the shame. That's how you endure the cross. Whenever you think you can bear no more, whenever you think you can go no further, whenever the whole world seems to be against you, that's when you're going to find out who God is. That's when you're going to get to know him like you've never known him before. That's when it's going to be just you and him. And I'm certain as I stand here that on that cross, during those three hours of darkness, it was just Jesus and the Father. And at the end of that, when our sin was placed upon him, he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And for that little moment, Jesus was forsaken of the Father and he prayed. And God heard his prayer and it was over. Amen. <laughs> it was over. And he was with him to never be separated again. So that we never have to be separated. So that we never have to be away from the Father. So that we never have to endure suffering alone. So that we never have to go to the graveside to bury a loved one without God being with us. So that we never have to go through a trial that what God is with us. I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. You ever wonder what Jesus was doing during those three hours? Nobody could see. God shut the lights out. And he come down in the thick darkness. I don't know how he done it. I don't know why he done it. But he lifted up his head. You see, in Gethsemane, God sent an angel. But on the cross, God came himself. And as soon as he went away, Jesus cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then he cried, it is finished. Amen. The psalm says, I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. I laid me down. He laid down his life. No man took it from him. I laid me down and slept. He went to sleep. Because that's all death is for us Christians is sleep. I awakened. The moment you go to sleep in death, you awake in the very presence of God. There's no purgatory. It's not in the Bible. The moment you go to sleep, you awake. You and your loved one, you watch them. 
I'm almost certain that that last Sunday that Luke was with us, the Lord allowed him to tell us goodbye. I'll never forget him Walk, going up the steps. Caleb carried him up the steps, waving at us. I, I, never, I had no worries. I had no fears. I didn't need to. God was with him. And he's with the Father. And someday I'll be with him. But until I'm there with him, he's here with me. Jesus, in his darkest hour, the earth full of darkness, his head hung low. Where is his help at? Many there be would say of me, there's no help for him in God. Oh, if he's a Christian, why is he going through this trial? If he's a Christian, why does he have to suffer this loss? If he's a man of God, why, why can't he get his prayers answered? Why does he have to go through this? God says, I can't tell you, heathen, why. But whenever I shield him from you and I show up with him, he'll know. And if I let him live, I'll let him tell you that the place where you'll meet God is in your darkest hour. He'll be with you. Where did Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego meet him? In the burning, fiery furnace. Amen. And after three hours, Jesus cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then he gave up the ghost. It's incredible. Psalm 3, I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. I laid me down and slept. I awake, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people. At this point in time, there was no multitude. After God, Jesus didn't see the multitude anymore. He didn't hear them anymore. It'll be a good day in your life when you become numb to the world. Amen. What they say or what they do doesn't affect you anymore. You're still living down here, but you're not really here anymore because you've transcended this world. You're not a victim anymore. They can say what they want to say about you. That's what the crucified life will do for you. I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people that have set themselves against me. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies up on the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. And then Jesus, despising the shame for the joy that set down before him, salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. I just hope you'll think on that for a minute. Some, someday you'll wonder where God is. And you'll find out he's the lifter up of your head. He'll meet you in that darkest hour, in that lowest place. But first, first things first, you need to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Amen. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That Savior that died on that cross and suffered, he did that for you and me. If you've never asked him to save you, why not now? If you are saved, would you... Would you consider bearing the cross? Are you afraid of the reproach of Jesus? Do you not want to identify it as one of his people? Are you like Simon? Are we like Simon Peter? We don't want to bear the reproach. Is someone going to have to compel us to bear the cross? Or are we willing? Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Would you stand? Are you here today and have never trusted Jesus? Are you here today and you're saved on your way to heaven? Would you, would you be willing to say publicly, God, I'll bear the cross that you have for me because I know that, God, I know you'll be with me and you'll give me the strength. You need to come and pray, you come. If you're here without the Lord, the Bible said, for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved.
You know, it's good to have fun in life, and I do have fun. It's good to laugh. It's good to, it's good to have joy in life. But listen to me this morning. There's a cross to bear. There's a responsibility. Jesus ought not to be an option in our life. We'll try for a little while, but when it gets difficult, we'll quit. Jesus didn't quit. He didn't give up. He didn't throw in the towel. And he did it because God came down with him so that he could endure the suffering, so that he could endure the shame. You'll never get to know the Father until you realize the suffering of the cross.